Good evening everyone, time for another member update. This is a daily chart of silver provided by netdania.com. You can click on the link below. Now we're definitely coming to a head here fairly soon. I don't think there's much more time for us to get some kind of resolution. You can see this is kind of a picture perfect downtrend here in silver. And now a breakout even above 20 can indicate a trend change. That's pretty amazing that we're low enough that a breakout through 20 could indicate a change of this trend that goes all the way back to May Day. May Day, May Day. The 1st of May, that infamous week where Obama released a fake birth certificate where they announced the fake capture of bin Laden, where they did a series of five hikes in margin, starting in the overnight, and of course they cratered the price of silver. So something has got to give. This is going to come to a head pretty soon. Now this is very interesting from Bix Weir. It's covered on the blog. Pardon any problems that you see in the video here or in the sound. I'm testing out a new wireless headset. I'm also testing out a new laptop, so we'll see if this works. This is from Bixware Putin's silver response, Rotoruta.com, Bixware, April 23rd. Just days before the Obama administration announces new sanctions on Russia, there is news coming out of Russia that there is a new limited edition one kilogram silver coin being released with Putin's likeness on it. Russia special Putin coins marked Crimea annexation. From the BBC, Vic says, is this a warning to the West that Putin knows the bankster's Achilles heel is physical silver? Will Putin announce a massive silver purchase program if Obama goes too far? Are we approaching the end of the road for the silver manipulators? Who knows, but anything is possible at this delicate stage of the battle for our freedom. Keep an eye out for the escalation of everything very soon. I have to agree with that. It's like, it just feels like the calm before the storm. Just crazy stuff. If you don't follow... Eric King, I really like Eric King because of the guests that he has. And one of the guests that I really like is this Grant Williams. He is fantastic. And he's talking about the hemorrhaging that's going on with the gold market. Eric King, the Chinese and the Russians understand what the end game is for Western central planners, which is why they've been buy buyers of physical gold, and in the case of the Chinese, prolific buyers. Do you get the feeling that the people in Asia who have been large buyers of physical gold understand where this is headed as well because they've seen so many paper currencies in the various countries come and go? Williams. It certainly gives the people in the East a much better foundation in terms of understanding how this is likely to play out versus people in the West. You've had two generations in the West now who've had nothing but, at least notionally and optically, an increase in the standard of living. The problem for the West is that this increase in the standard of living has all been built on debt. But yes, people in the East understand that gold offers protection and that gold is real wealth. You have to remember that this is not a part of the world where people are taking out home equity lines of credit, increasing their mortgages and using that money to sustain a temporary lifestyle. There's a completely different cultural outlook in the East. Now, if you remember, Jimmy Rogers covered that. A lot of people were talking about the housing bubble, but very few knew. I think the statistic that I heard at the time was that the Chinese were requiring as much as 40% down. Can you imagine what would happen to the American housing market if to buy a house you had to put 40% down? Well, it would just be a complete collapse. You have to remember that during the last big gold bull market in the 1970s, of course, Asia was a much poorer part of the world. So when gold spiked to 850 in January 1980, that wasn't Asian buying because there really wasn't any money in this part of the world back then. What we're now seeing is the East is part of the world that has become richer 
and that's only going to increase so Asia is becoming more wealthy and when you have a bunch of people who believe that gold is money gold is safety and gold is wealth and who are getting more disposable income they're going to continue to buy it and so whether it's on a central bank level with various central banks in the east looking to diversify out of their large holdings of treasuries in US dollars or from the ground up where it's the man or woman on the street who can suddenly afford to buy one gold coin each month either way that gold is flying from west to east this further illustrates that the west just doesn't get it but the east does this trend will continue until it's too late at that point western countries will have seen too much of their gold flow to the east and it will be a case of having to halt that flow of gold and it will be too late by then the west won't get that gold back Williams said, I think the Achilles heel of the West is the politicians. I think they are inept and they are focused on all the wrong things and the danger of a miscalculation on a political level by a very inept group in the West against the very smart operators that you have in the East is potentially a big Achilles heel. Now, I, I think it's probably naive to attribute what's going on in the West to an inept group of people. That's like saying 911 happened because they were inept. That's absurd. Gold is certainly something that, despite protests by Western central bankers to the contrary, they do think a lot about and it's something they watch. But if they did get, if they did the right thing, the gold price would go higher. When I say the right thing, I mean if they converted more reserves in the West to gold, yes, the price would go higher. And when you look at the incredible problems facing the West, with the sheer amount of debt, watching the price of gold soar is not something they can allow if they're trying to print massive quantities of money. If they allow the gold price to head significantly higher than the underlying inflation in the West, is going to become far more evident, and that's something that doesn't play politically well. Well, it's already evident. The reason why it's not becoming evident is because they're just simply lying about it. They have rigged inflation statistics. So I think the political class is by far the most dangerous thing that the West has to face at the moment. And we are in a year where there are going to be elections all over Europe, midterms in the United States. So the political landscape is where we're going to see some real fireworks this year. Now, a lot of people poo-poo the stuff on King World News, and it really can be tiresome because everything's just a big screaming headline. But eventually all this stuff is going to come true. Now, I wanted to cover Jeff Nielsen because this is interesting that he actually gets fairly deep into silver. We're going to skim this to start with and get down to the silver. As indicated in my most recent commentary, we're very likely in a post-default world in the gold market. Specifically, at some time, likely several years ago, the bankers' paper gold market experienced technical default where current and immediate claims on existing gold inventories significantly exceeded those inventories. Actual versus official inventories of the gold in the bankers' metals warehouses today are now, at large, are now a large negative number in many millions of ounces. Official and visible default in the gold market has only been averted by a cornucopia of fraud, primarily fractional reserve banking in the gold market, i.e., through selling each ounce of actual gold possessed by this banking cabal to numerous chump owners. The magnitude of this fractional reserve fraud is something about which we can only speculate, but we do have parameters with respect to their own fraudulent debauched paper currencies. The Western Banking Crime Syndicate is allowed to leverage their paper by a ratio of roughly 33 to 1, we also know in this area of mark to fantasy accounting that these big banks, big bank tentacles have at least two sets of books. Furthermore, we know that these career criminals have no respect for any laws having already been fined or investigated for any and every form of financial crime capable of being devised within the human mind. The notion that these banksters adhere to mere rules on leverage limits and reserve requirements is quaint and utterly naive. In the realm of bullion trading, i.e. gold and silver fraud, we also have the testimony of ex-Goldman Sachs stooge Jeffrey Christian to guide us. It was the 100-to-1 Christian who first 
blurted out at a CFTC hearing that various forms of paper fraud committed by the bankers in the gold market exceeded the actual amount of gold being traded by a dollar value of 100 to 1. In the silver market, we have various reasons for believing that the crisis faced by the bankers in terms of evaporating inventories and stockpiles is even more severe, desperate than the gold market, and thus the level of fraud is likely at least as high, if not higher. The starting point in such suspicions is the now infamous chart on supposed silver inventories, which the one bank probably wishes its minions had never created. Now, this is a chart of silver inventories, but take note here of this statement. Inventories include silver-backed exchange-traded funds, or ETFs. Source, CPM Group. The sickening plunge in silver inventories between 1990 and 2005, where inventories collapsed by 90%, meant that we were already at a crisis point in the silver market nearly a decade ago, where, it only, where it's only in the last year or two where anecdotal evidence and the banker's own actions seems to indicate a crisis in gold inventories, yet actual default in the gold market likely occurred several years before this. As was also explained in my last commentary, we have... No reason to believe that the supposed reversal in silver inventories depicted in the chart above has ever taken place. This is because most of these phantom inventories in the silver market, by the banker's own calculations, are composed of nothing but the holdings of the banker-operated bullion ETFs, which themselves are nothing but gigantic paper fraud. I agree. We obtain absolute empirical proof that these bullion ETFs are nothing but paper during the stampede out of the largest of the gold bullion ETFs, the SPDR Gold Trust, GLD, which began in the spring of 2013 when panicked unit holders dumped 40% of the holdings of this fraud fund on a net basis. If that fund had actually contained any gold, COMEX inventory should have exploded higher as all that gold was dumped onto the market. Instead, as we saw, COMEX inventories went in the opposite direction, plummeting lower in fraudulent synchronization with GLD. It's the bankers who tell us that most of our official inventories of silver and gold are nothing more than the supposed holdings of bullion funds where they conveniently are the custodians. It's the bankers who have shown us that these same bullion funds are nothing but paper. But all of this discussion centers on inventories. There's only one half the, that is only one half the equation when it comes to available existing supplies of bullion. The somewhat more visible side, the invisible portion of this supply is represented by stockpiles. Here it's important to engage in a definition of terms so that readers can clearly distinguish between these two distinct concepts which are often muddled together. An inventory, supposedly, represents the amount of silver or gold which is immediately available to any buyer willing to pay current spot or futures price. Stockpiles, conversely, represent the amount of gold slash silver which is potentially available for sale or consumption, but only at some undetermined higher price level. How quickly such stockpiles would, could ever come onto market, i.e. at how low a price, is primarily a function of how highly the present owners, holders of these stockpiles actually value their silver and gold. But this assumes that the holders of these stockpiles are primarily motivated by maximizing proceeds from the sale of these stockpiles. In the case of the silver market, we have many reasons to believe that the majority of the stockpiles, likely the vast majority, are held by a cabal separate from the bankers, but clearly allied to them, the industrial silver users. Here the authority is Charles Savoy, whose detailed chronology of the silver market he has aptly entitled, The Silver Stealers. According to a large body of evidence compiled by Savoy and his own work connecting the dots, it is our servile politicians who facilitated the looting of most of the world's silver and the bankers who perpetrated most of that stealing, but it's the industrial silver users who are likely 
the holders of what remains from what was pillaged from the markets and even nations. The nexus of this alliance among the oligarchs is that unlike with gold, the bankers have no desire to hold silver themselves. They simply want to prevent ordinary people from holding silver. I absolutely agree with that. It's only when ordinary people can be prevented or simply deceived from storing their wealth in the safety of silver or gold that they will turn to the bankers' paper currencies. As knowledgeable readers now understand, the moment that anyone is foolish enough to hold their wealth in the banker's paper currency, such wealth can be stolen completely over time through a plethora of frauds, but primarily through the game of currency dilution. So it is the bankers who have made silver available to be bought and hoarded by the silver users at fraudulent bargain basement prices. In return, the silver users have promised to use as much of this hoarded silver as they want while recycling as little as possible, thus literally consuming global stockpiles of silver. What is the best way to ensure that the billions of little people around the world can't convert the wealth from their labors into the security of silver? Destroy that silver first. Here the authority is noted researcher and veteran silver analyst Ted Butler. According to Butler's estimates, global stockpiles of silver exceeded 6 billion ounces as recently as the 1950s. On a per capita basis, that amounted to more than two ounces per inhabitant of our planet. But that's when the industrial usage of silver really began to ramp up, aided greatly at that time by the explosion in the use of silver-based photographic film. Going back nearly a decade, Butler estimates that this rapacious consumption of global silver stockpiles had, had has devastated those stockpiles by Butler's own calculations and by last decade by the last decade the world's stockpile of silver had declined to approximately 1 billion ounces or roughly 0.15 of an ounce per human inhabitant with silver presently less than 10% as plentiful or more than 10 times more precious clearly the one bank's crusade to keep silver out of the hands of ordinary people is much a much simpler one today, but success has its price. The bankers' ongoing and illegal scorched earth tactics against the gold and silver miners is stifling almost all new mine development. The consequence of this is that mine supply has peaked and that with gold is already on the decline. Meanwhile, the continued suppression of prices means close to maximum demand, at least in the three quarters of the world, which still understands the difference between money and currency. Combined, this has created a massive supply deficit in both the gold and silver markets. The difference is that unlike silver, global gold stockpiles have been conserved. There is, thus, there is a much larger stockpile of gold accessible to the bankers, which they can then sell to multiple owners. But in the silver market, the one bank's economic terrorism now works against it. Having simultaneously destroyed most of the stockpiles, of the world stockpiles of silver and create a massive supply deficit in the silver market. We are now in a countdown to an event beyond the unofficial default in the bankers' fraudulent paper markets. Soon the silver market will simply implode. The world will literally run out of silver. The obvious question on readers' minds is when. Part two will sift through the falsified data and do some mind crunching some number crunching with the data which is reliable in an effort to provide some answers to that question so excellent article from Jeff Nielsen hits on all the points I've been talking about for years about the silver market it is the most suppressed the most manipulated and potentially the most explosive market that's out there the fundamentals haven't changed they've, they've just gotten better for silver so let's Look at some silver. I wanted to look at this African wildlife series. Now, I picked up a number of these in the past, and I just wanted to get an update and see where they're at. If you remember, they're minted by this uh, Hopmanzan, or however you pronounce that, that mint. The oldest mint in Europe, apparently, or maybe in the world. 
and uh, you know it's not officially sanctioned by the Somalian government. There isn't a Somalian government, but they issue it in the name of Somalia. Now they have this elephant series they've been issuing for quite some time. You can see that the 2014 here they have 733 of those left. And they're about 22.49 if you buy 500 or more, so, so that's going to be almost all of them. But if you get 100, then it's about 23 bucks. That's not bad. That's a little over three bucks over spot. But if we look at the previous years, you can see, not looking at the snake privy, but just the BU one. That one is out of stock for 2013, while this snake privy is. They're asking. $55 on AppMax. Now, the 2012, you can see they got 78 left. They're asking for about 45 bucks. These are, these are the ones I bought. The 2011, 39.50. Now, if you remember, I told you before that that I that was the highest price I had paid for coin. I think I paid 32 or 34, something like that. So. That's the most I've ever paid for silver, and I'm not at all upset with that coin. I'm very happy with it, all of these coins. I really like the Elephant series. It's not my favorite, but I definitely like this series. And you can see that the price, at least on AppMax, now admittedly we don't have a buyback price from them, but if you check eBay, what they're actually going for, it's going to be significantly higher. So this could be a decent bet here. It's fairly likely that any of the elephant coins are going to continue to appreciate in value. I wouldn't say this one is my favorite, but it does have that baby elephant on. And they have had that for the last few years. So it is a very nice coin. So back to the chart. We are rapidly approaching, in my opinion, an inflection point. The chart that I've been seeing lately, the indications seem that they're going to try a drop. I think they're going to try to drop down. Now, it's going to be very interesting to see where that goes. It's also going to be a potential very good buying opportunity. And also, it is potentially going to be a very serious snapback point because if we get down there, we're going to be talking about, you can see this decline. We're talking about 50 cents a month. We're going down now in this trend. So you can see how long this trend has gone. This trend is going to reverse. Will it be a violent reversal? It may. It may coincide with some major worldwide news. It, the feeling in the air is, especially now with, with Putin putting out a silver coin, that things are coming to a head. I know I've said that a lot, but it definitely feels stronger now than it ever has. And we'll talk to you next time.